Hello, everyone. Um, this is such a wonderful, wonderful morning because we, we have, I have um, two of my major life heroes here with me. And well, uh, I mean, uh, yes, <laughs> but uh, uh, George Chung, who, you know, uh, uh, coming from a Hapkido style, we didn't ever have forms, so I never really did forms. But this is the single reason why I started doing forms was watching this gentleman in action and seeing him do the, the beautiful kicks and the choreography and the musical forms and all that stuff that you know he used to do. And we kind of lost in touch for last, you know, what 20, 25 years or whatever it's been. And uh, of course, Richard, you know. I, I, you know, I've done a lot of stuff with him before, and you know his influence is all around our studio and our culture here. But uh, it's what a great pleasure to have these gentlemen here. But I wanted to catch up, you know, with George and tell you we, you know, we saw you doing the forums, we saw you doing the competition. I ran into you into the Super Show a couple of times. But um, what happened in between, and where are you at now? And I, you, I, you, from a little bit we talked this morning, you're doing some great stuff for the martial art world. You always have been, but now you're doing it, you know, this way. So if you can share. With with us. Sure, sure. You know, after I after I uh, retired from martial arts competition, uh, I, I took a very traditional track of teaching, like 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 many martial artists do. Uh, I had a chain of schools in Northern California. We opened up eleven of them, um, and and it was it was quite successful. Um, and at the time, um, I was finding myself really uh, interested in, in the fitness and performance training, and uh, um, even more so than, than, than the traditional martial arts. And I wanted to apply a lot of that to sports. And so uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, I started training a, a lot of athletes. And that segued me into a, almost a brand new career of training uh, uh, martial arts uh, with, with football. And I ended up spending 14 years at the San Francisco 49ers into the early 2000s. And it, and it was an amazing uh, uh, time in my life because it really taught me a different way of, of, of imparting knowledge at a, at a team level. Where oftentimes in, in the martial arts world, uh, there is what we have, what we call a, a guru approach, where it's a one person approach to do it. Where in team sports, you have to have many, many coaches uh, on That's a team. And so mm -hmm. it, it really taught me to be you know, a, a team player, that I, I was one facet of, of, an, of an athlete's journey to ultimately you know, perform the best that they can. And it was, so it was humbling, it was enlightening, it was fascinating, you know, it was a real growth period. What happened during that, that, that period, though, in, in, in pro football, you know, you only work six months out of the year at the time. And so I literally had six months off out of the year. And I had a, I had a, a media background. It, it wasn't extensive, but I really, you know, I had a background in production. And at the time, the 49ers were looking at uh, creating a multicultural uh, initiative because of the very diverse population in the Bay Area, Latino, Asian. And they asked me if I would put together the first uh, uh, multicultural television show for the 49ers, which really got me heavily involved in understanding international television, being able to service television programming for an international audience, Spanish speaking, Chinese speaking, Vietnamese speaking. Um, and it was, it, was, it was a great learning experience. And, and by the end, you know, we produced 500 shows uh, for the team. And I, and I learned so much from that, it helped literally helped me segue into my new career, which was now today what I do is I do international television distribution um, for uh, multicultural uh, television networks, whether they be in, in 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 the Far East or in the Middle East or in Southeast Asia, and so today my company, uh, which is called Jungo, um, uh, distributes television. Uh, we are a uh, Los Angeles-based company, um, but in addition to that. We also have our own television networks that we own and operate, and one of them happens to be a martial arts television network called Combat Go. Wonderful. So we're very, very excited that we're launching it right now on many of the big platforms like Samsung TV and Roku, uh, where this channel will really be uh, celebrating martial arts from around the world, targeting uh, the market of people that love diverse martial arts, whether it's kickboxing or, 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 or fighting from other parts of the world, but not necessarily only MMA, but all different parts of the world, and uh, we're very excited to be able to bring that uh, to the world. So, be more of an educational. No, of it, different systems, maybe different styles, so, so, different people. So, the <clears throat> the network really is it's a combination. I would say ninety percent of the programming on the network is competitive, combative, which is in the ring. So, you know, Muay Thai, traditional kickboxing, right, right. MMA. We have a group out of uh, Nigeria called Dambe, traditional African fighting. You were telling yeah. me about that. That mm, just sounds so interesting. Yeah. So we we're, we're able to really curate. 
and discover great martial arts from around the world. Every culture has their own fighting style. Right. And what we're trying to do is to try to act as a platform, uh, an international platform, because right now Combat Go is, is, is currently carried in, in several countries. And we're, we're, we're in Brazil, we're in uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, soon to be in the Philippines, uh, India. Wonderful. So really what we're trying to do is we're trying to give a showcase for oftentimes unknown or little known martial arts uh, competitive styles to give them uh, an international ex uh, showcase and exposure, but at the same time, give our viewers the discoverability of being able to see something that they would normally not find unless they were you know, hunting and pecking all night long on YouTube. Right. I find it amazing that both of you guys, in, in your own ways, you kind of went out to the entertainment field and films and that stuff, and you are in, your, in the way you're doing, but you still come back to martial arts. You still come back to what was your first love, your first passion, and there's still, how do you, how, how do you do that? Do you still, you think that just in you, it just it comes out still, you're still martial, doesn't matter what you do? I, I think part of it is, you know, in, in our business, when we start a television network, we're looking always for what's called subject matter expertise, SME, and, you know, Fortunately, I, 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 you know, I have expertise in the subject, and so it was it was a natural fit to start a television network with martial arts, where I took a different approach because I've had such a long uh, a career as a media executive. I take one hat as a media executive and say, okay, how do I create a television network that will be able to play in 50 countries um, to a diverse audience? You know, whether it's 16 to 49 or 18 to 24, uh, in multiple countries, and then at the same time, I I, I put on the martial arts hat and I surround myself with really top talent from a programming side, from a technical side, to create a really great channel. So, you know, our, our program director for, uh, for Combat Go is Tony Parrish, who's a, a former NFL star, but Tony was one of the first NFL players that embraced martial arts as a cross-training tool. So not only does he love the fitness aspect of it, but he, he, he's authentic to the martial arts spirit. So when we put together the, the channel, it was important for us to find authentic experts in the field that will allow us to grow the channel because the most important thing in any form of entertainment is you must have authenticity. Right. If you don't, the audience is way too smart and they'll see through it. So you always want to have a, a, a product that the audience can appreciate and go, yeah, you know, this is something that really speaks and resonates to me. Right. How do you how do you guys and I've, I've known you just from from a little bit of time I spent with you and I've known you forever How do you how do you stay so neutral? Like you don't go to this way. You don't go that way. You don't get into the politics You don't get into but you just stay to your core thing and you don't you know go, Belong to any groups or you know anything you just kind of do your how do you how do you do that? Because most of my audience is gonna be martial arts school owners and we want to have a long term You know long, long life in martial arts. How do you do that? Uh, it's, it's difficult, you know. I, I think what changed me, you know, when I started training in Australia, it was like a lot of systems. You either did Shotokan, you did Taekwondo, or whatever. It was actually coming to America that changed that for me. And it was a very eclectic kind of environment where it was okay to go and train. You know, I used to train with, you know, do a little bit of training with George and Cynthia Rothrock and Fumio Demura and, of course, later on with the grappling so it was like where's the knowledge I'm gonna go there you know so it it made you very apolitical right. you know I was never just a Japanese martial artist you know when I came here and so I think that was that's quite disarming you know because we talked about that you know if you always just represent yourself as say a, for me it was Goju you know Goju Kai was my original style that's all you are it's hard to fit in with a Taekwondo school or a Hapkido school or whatever. But the fact that I train with so many different people, I'd just go wherever I could get knowledge, as you know, with Senza Benny, the Jet. Started kickboxing with him in 79 before the Jet Center. So all of that, I think, was allowed me to be apolitical and just be a martial artist rather than seen as a particular stylist. Right. You know? I find that, you know, as a, as a former school owner, um, one of the things that happened, you know, in, in the early days of, of, of when I first started the schools, I was much younger and um, I, I had a much narrower view of the world. And so at the time when I opened the school, I was very competitive to anyone. Even if the guy was across town 20 miles away, they were my competition. And what I quickly learned, especially owning 
multiple schools in Northern California. Literally, we ended up with 11, 11 schools. It was myself and, and, and the former Wushu master, Anthony Chan. And But one thing that we learned was the martial arts business was a very a very regional business and a business of convenience and oftentimes that you know your 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 market for many of your schools uh, you attract a certain area uh, with within with, with the, within right. that that neighborhood and so what happens is the person across town might not be your competition even though you might view them as your competition at the end of the day the customer decides and what I also learned was that you know, studying martial arts is a lot like a relationship. It's a lot like dating, and not everyone fits together. And so you could have a martial arts school, and, and, and you might be superior to the guy next door or the guy down the street, but the student that walks in, if you're not relatable to that student or if you don't, if the student doesn't feel comfortable, you're not a right match. That's why, you know, people take a long time to find their mate, their soulmate. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing with martial arts, uh, that, that at the end of the day, the student oftentimes gravitates to certain schools. So if that's the case, then we really aren't competitive to each other, <clears throat> you know, because the student ultimately is going to make the decision of where they're going to go. Wonderful, wonderful. But I think that whole environment's changed, right, I think, with mixed martial arts. Mm -hmm. I, the only unfortunate thing for me is that that loyalty of that student, that's just loyalty to that one teacher yeah. would, would, I mean, when I started, we'd never think of training with yeah. even another instructor no matter how good they were yes yes Whereas yes now people kind of shop around they want to do boxing here they'll do a bit of grabbing right. here they'll do a bit of kicking here it's sort of a it's not as it's not as held in high esteem that you just stay with right one school having said that i know with you know team karate centers you know they'll do grappling and a screamer and kickboxing and everything else so that's at least an answer to that absolutely mm. absolutely well this just so totally made my day. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank both you. Of you. You guys have been influence, you know, for me personally and my school for, for forever. But uh, um, but this will be a great thing for all the school owners that you guys and and we look forward to seeing more stuff coming thank you. from you. Definitely. And uh, the whole you know martial arts channel stuff. Uh, and thank you, everyone.